This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend. Hello, my dear friends. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Marco. Hello, Amina. Hello. 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 You, like, you look to be very far away from me. Where are you guys? Uh, I'm in Greece, in Crete. Uh yeah, I'm in Italy, northern Italy at the moment, currently. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So, Amina, you're 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 a specialist. So you are working with the historical ecology of Egypt, and you specialized in Balti dogs. Yeah, I um, I actually at the time, right before I started my masters, I my father found the street dog, and he um, decided to bring him in the house. And we had no idea what this breed is or what we should expect in the future when he becomes an adult. And even when I try to Google, there's nothing, nothing at all about them anywhere. So I thought, why not try to uh, create the information myself? Exactly. You know, if you don't yeah. find something, you, you create it. You, you, you yeah. find solutions of it. And, and you, Marco, you're doing kind of the same thing on the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, I, I am particularly curious about all canines, but in um, more specifically, I've been studying Bali dogs in Bali Island, uh, so Indonesia. And uh, this is um, um, endemic canine population. So is uh, is from that area. Is a specific type of free ranging dogs, and it's very fascinating. I'm so excited to have you guys here. And we had struggles in the morning because I couldn't get my system going. <laughs> so I'm still kind of like shaky. Do you guys have everybody coffee? You have a Greek coffee. You have Italian Pour coffee. Pour some coffee on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> so how did we met? So I met um, Marco. We were having, I was looking around about stuff. I don't remember. I was looking about, um, dogs how they function in 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 real environment and uh, which is a passion of mine to kind of bring dogs to be able to live in a pet environment like in, in an in-home environment as close as possible to their reality and there is literally nothing out there so as as behaviorists what we do and, and the scientific community they refer to wolves they take the pet that we have in the house and compare them straight to the wolves and then from there, we project back to the dog what the wolf does in our home. And I was like, that's so wrong. It's kind of like going, going to the jungle, observe monkeys, and go back to New York and teach people how to behave in yeah. an elevator. <laughs> Come yeah. on, give me a break. And so this is how I found Marco, because he was doing a video on the beach about dogs. And I was like, I, I like that. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Click on it. And so we become friends. Come look, two years ago, right? And yeah, a bit more maybe. Right. More, and so more, yeah. Marco and I coming from an angle of being more holistic approach, um, not more. I, I, I think we define holistic approach in animal behavior. And, and I'm proud that we're kind of on the same wavelength. But I feel also um, Amina does the same thing because she tries to kind of wrap her mind around that. How did we end up from a dog or a canine that was praised by priests. The pyramids were built. Um, pharaohs were buried with them, which is a short portion. We're going back 2000 before or 4000 before Christ, kind of to give it a number. And then we have 14,000 years before that, a relationship with dogs. What happened? What did, why don't we have information? How can you live? as a human with a species so close together for 14,000 years. And I believe more than that, just that's what we can prove, right? And have no clue what these species are. Like we know more about flies than we know about dogs. What, what do you think, um, Amina? What did we miss? What happened? I think 
because the dog is so stuck between humans and animals like animals are very different than humans but still the dog is so close to the humans that we kind of forgot to give them the same attention as we do other species you know and how, how do you feel um what what happened why suddenly we lost all the information why do we suddenly think that dogs pe bad people have to be thrown to the dogs as we can read in the bible for example and you know exactly. what happened yeah, I think, to be honest it's um, religions in a way because um, in my research i found that in christianity and judaism and hinduism just like in islam um there's just some kind of picture they portrayed the dog in as vicious or uh, kills or bites or dirty or impure or the beast the devil the beast exactly yeah. like in all these religions and people follow religions and they don't really like think like they just get what they're told and act based on that and people just forget that these animals are sentient beings and have feelings and all that. So this is exactly what happened in Egypt, like in the beginning of urbanization in Egypt and the growing of bureaucracy and all that. Dogs were roaming freely in Egypt, living with the other humans, other animals, and then all of a sudden just pushed out of the society by culling them, poisoning them, killing them, they, did, they just did not want them, and especially in Egypt, because it's an Islamic country. In Islam, there's a lot of talk and hadiths by, by Islamic scholars that if you have a dog in the house, angels can't enter the home. And if you touch a dog's nose, you have to clean yourself again because dog is impure and you can't go pray when you're impure because you touch the dog. So people just like to avoid dogs in general and funny enough after all these years till today people see dogs the same way that's that's important um i grew up in iraq for uh, almost a short decade um 74 to 79 to be correct <clears throat> and i had two Salukis, no, three Salukis in my property that I grew up with. I had a fox and I had the eagle and I had the boar, like a puppy boar kind of thing. And it's very common there to dogs be just free. Now we have to define what is free. Free, free roaming dog is when the dog has a choice to go in um, and be free to choose where to go. And I also see that certain um, families ha have a dog they care for because they protect them. He's guarding them from coming in and the dog is close to the property, but they don't own the dog. He's part of that family, but he's not in the family. Make sense? So the dog has a free choice to go wherever he wants, get with the kids to class, to school and come back again and, and wait for them to return for the school bus. But it's it's kind of they create a synergistic system around them, and it seems at some point something happened, and the dog was not free anymore to do that. He yeah. was inside instead of outside. Marco, how how is the situation in down in Bali? How how do people handle the dogs there? Well, uh, interestingly, uh, based on what you are already uh, uh, suggesting and referring. Um, I want to mention about the religious aspects because uh, while Indonesia is a, a mostly a Muslim Muslim country, Bali is uh, an Hindu country, an Hindu part of Indonesia has an important influence from in Hindu culture, and uh, so conversely, from some approaches that we may find in some places. Uh, based on some uh, religious influences. Uh, in the case of Bali, um, we have dogs that are considered, at least historically and traditionally, are considered um, 
um, secret animals because when uh, um, the five Pandava in the in the mythology, let's say to make it short, in the mythology in Indian mythology, five brothers Pandava um, starts their start their path to to the end of the world or to the heaven, right? The four of them, four uh, uh, get lost and die on the way, also the wife of one of them. And there is just the last brother, which is accompanied by a dog for all the journey, right? And when he gets to the, to the door of the heaven and the God brings, uh, uh, put a stair, uh, some stairs outside of the sky, for inviting him, okay, you made a long journey, you can come in. Okay, and, and when he is going to climb the stairs, calls the dog and say, okay, come, we are we arrive, we have arrived to the heaven. But the gods say, hey, hey, wait, you cannot bring this dog inside the heaven, right? Because this is a, a impure animal, uh, we accept just humans. And then, then uh, Yudhishthira, this, the, the most, the, the the wise the the one that has the the the, the brings carries the value of wisdom right it answers hey i've been doing this long journey but if i cannot bring this loyal friend into the heaven i am ready to give up and throw away all of the efforts and the loss and grief that i've been experiencing to doing for while I was doing this journey, this trip, if I cannot bring this animal with me, right? And then it turns out that the dog himself, it, it turns in, in, into a god. It turns into God himself, right? It was an expression of God, right? So in the in the in the uh, Bhagavad Gita and other uh, areas of uh, the uh, Indian mythology, dogs are highly highly valued right and so traditionally it is also in the case of bali now uh because bali has been enormously influenced and uh, affected by uh, westernization and uh, economy everything changed uh, in the last uh, 100 years or so some aspects of, of the traditional values have been somehow lost or um, let's say merged with other with other cultural influences right uh, so we have also at certain point we had also the opposite spectrum where dogs were perceived as dirt dirt and and carrier of diseases especially because actually there was an historical moment 2008 when the rabies outbreak arrived to Bali and so that changed the whole perception and then we had a, an endemic population of 800,000 Bali dogs dropping in, in a decade to 120, 130,000 so a drop of maybe 85 percent because there were there were different states different massive callings and and, um, and elimination of dogs right so just this to give a, an overview, but uh, yes, it's also to say that the intricate um, connection of uh, religion and beliefs and, uh, and, and dogs is a recurring aspect that, and is very interesting because it brings up a lot of essential information to understand human societies and to understand also dogs and how certain dogs have developed within a certain human society or in the proximity of a certain human society, right? Exactly. I, I totally agree with you guys. What I researched so far, because the first thing when I came to US, I wasn't a dog trainer. Um, I love dogs. I work with Greek rescues. Um, I stopped working with in, in Greece with rescues after um, our Olympic games where basically dogs were mass murdered literally in a week um i get goosebumps and and i was like i was so angry about that i basically just i'm done i had yeah. to totally yeah. you know bur burn out I, I was carrying in my car multiple bags of dog food spent my money there <laughs> driving the streets up and down and feeding the dogs um and i literally hated humanity for that at that point 
because a they are an important part of you know the hygiene of certain areas in Greece because they're they're scavenging they they clear out they are selective but they are part of hygiene I cannot imagine India being without dogs it would be the disaster the same thing with Egypt and Tunis mm -hmm. and Spain and in Italy whatever also you know um, but one thing that I, I recognize in US is there there is a thing that got my attention there was an ancient Indian tribe I don't recall right now which tribe that was that tells the story about the dogs so there was the God who created dogs and then had the dogs play on earth and then he decided to create humans and he placed the humans with the dogs but the dog the humans didn't treat the dogs well so he took the humans out again of the equation and bought back better humans and I was like wait a minute why would a native American tribe come up with that story like in a, a mythology has somewhere a, a reality into it that's packaged over the period of time is kind of modified a little bit but the idea that a god will send first the dogs to confirm his creation then send the people into it to confirm the creation and suddenly those two don't make it well because the human didn't treat the dog well as expression of God and it kind of comes in similarity what you see from Bali and all of a sudden it's like hmm I screwed it up human in out new human in and I was like that is a bigger thing and this is where I start searching into Egypt and I searched into Anunnaki and I searched into Africa and I searched to all these places there's always a dog being an important piece in in a humanity and I have the feeling that we are talking about a dog being a sentient being a but what's going on behind the scenes so when I am doing my healing work and, and I work with people I always ask the question when 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 I have people work on their own dogs energetically and spiritually I tell them is there a message for you and the people says well uh, the, they, they give me that info and they have no clue about that I'm not telling them what to say right and they say sometimes well I healed my dog and his collective those dogs that live with us in the house are connected to a dog collective and so while they're doing healing work on that dog that healing goes also to the collective that's connected to that particular dog from 13 to 45,000 are the numbers that I heard because I asked them the questions how many dogs are connected in that point I, I literally tap into the the dog consciousness and we get that information from there and I, I had no clue. wait a minute so that trauma that we just healed on that dog is connected to other traumas that are connected to that collective and so I recognize we have a breed collective the boxers the Bali dogs and the Egyptian dogs all these are traumas that these dogs carry on that we created in the past and then the next question is wait a minute are we calling in dogs into our life to help them heal while we are healing at the same time because those dogs have usually the similar traumas that we have and now I recognize that wait a minute maybe we have an arrangement before we come down here just like the ancient had that yeah. praise the dogs for that ascension process to, to clarify ascension is your process as you improve your frequency and, and you reach you know your, your purpose and all of a sudden we see that there must be an arrangement where we come down here as as the the Balinesian said I would not go back to heaven without my dog I, I wanted to add uh, another story from the Quran because uh, of the conflicting ideas. Um, actually, in the Quran, there's nothing bad about dogs. On the contrary, it it puts the dog on the same level as humans because there's the story of seven people, and their eighth is a dog, and they're hiding from people who want to kill them. They hide in a cave, and God for seven years or something like that and there's always a dog with them so it's it's strange how the dog in the quran is actually on the same level as a human being but when the humans started explaining what dogs are 
they just turned into these impure and scary creatures. So we have one of our team members here. It was my mistake. I, for some reason, I just didn't keep him up to date. So this is Daniel. Hey, Daniel. And Daniel. Hello. So Daniel, to keep you up to speed, we're talking about spirituality in dogs and we talk about how our relationship with dogs ended up in that situation. We're basically killing dogs. And back then we were praising dogs and built pyramids around dogs. And what is your experience with, with dog spirituality? And, and, and do you feel dogs are sentient beings? I certainly do. Um, I think New Zealand actually passed a law uh, within the last couple of years declaring all animals sent sentient beings, which is an interesting concept. Well, we cannot do that in the U.S. No way we can do that. You know what that means? Meat industry? Exactly. exactly. Training tools, housing situations. So... The, the reason why I thought I, I invited you here is to, I want to find a connection. How can we have a happy dog in a wellness environment being our partners in this complex social environment that we are right now? And I think we, we are missing a piece and I like to find that piece. How can we connect? How can we have the dog comply to the, our social problems that we have here, that the dog has to be confined, the dog has to be vaccinated, the dog has to have his dog food, and he has to be confined for multiple hours a day. How can we make the dog feel better in our relationship? How can we go back to this good old spiritual relationship that we have with the dog? Um, Amina, what, what do you think? I think and language. I believe the language we use puts the dogs in a certain place and when humans keep repeating the same words like pets or um, or like humanizing them by putting, the, putting on them clothes and like you said just putting them in the homes, I think the language we use needs to change around dogs and not and not treat them as a commodity, you know, like not, I'm going to, uh, especially buying and selling of dogs, like you don't buy and sell human beings, you know, you buy and sell uh, properties like cars and houses, but we should not be buying and selling and making profit out of the ongoing breeding of breeding that is not consensual. You know, it's just like I have two dogs and I want to sell the puppies to make some money. So I'm just going to breed them. And yeah, this is this is what I believe. And it's to me, it's all about the language we use. I try as much as I can to not say pets and say animals. I try as much as I can to just not treat them as my human babies, but just like my companions who also have, I should respect them. I should trust them I, and let them do what they want. Like, And also always remember that usually it would be my fault. Like if my dog has bad behavior and I call it bad behavior, people forget that the bad behavior is because of us. Even if it's just a rescue dog and I wasn't the one who, who created this bad behavior, but the bad behavior is coming from ancestral uh, traumas they, they, they witnessed and were affected by on the streets. I totally agree with you on that. Um, Marco, what do you think? A lot of things, Roman. This is, you know, there will be so much to say on those yeah. things. You know, I'm I, I'm having a hard time to contain all of my... <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> but yeah, in addition to uh, to what has been said already, um, yeah, of course, an important aspect to consider is that uh, at least a few important, actually a few important aspects to consider uh to answer your question that is why we 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 perceive dogs the way we perceive them nowadays and how we can improve their their uh, um, their well-being 
nowadays in our homes, in our societies, by recognizing their nature, right? Let's frame it also this way. And um, there are some important stru structures, way of framing things, influence, cultural influences, cultural constraints, cu cultural uh, procedure, cultural boxes, way that we have been exposed, the way we have been and we need to get rid of that, right? So uh, it's like we we are not able to to see with clear eyes. It's like we have a lot of uh, something around, you know, and and that doesn't allow the, all of those cultural conditioning do not allow us to see behind the veil, behind the curtain, what the dogs, what the dog is, right? And um, Mm, of course, uh, in the U.S. or in different areas of the U.S., there may be different types of conditioning, and then uh, in other areas of the world, there are other types of conditioning. But uh, there are also some. So that's geographically. Uh, it may be based on on geography, but historically thinking is. Uh, for example, there are some common threads, some common, uh, some recurring influences that that. World, for example, where we where we have the majority of companion family dogs, while in other areas of the world we have a majority of uh, uh, free ranging dogs, right? And uh, for example, the last few hundreds uh, of years, with the uh, with uh, for example the philosophy of Descartes that has established that um, just human being is able to think and feel while all of the other animals can uh, are just responding to na to to mechanical inputs and uh, stimuli and so on right and um, so we need to get rid of those things and of course that means to study and understand study some key aspects of the interaction and the development and the evolution of dogs and humans, right? Because um, understanding a little bit on uh, a little bit more for what is possible on domestication on the last uh, 30, 40,000 years of, uh, of evolution and parallel evolution of dogs and humans, it can bring really some new lenses into the eyes and take away all of those additional, not useful uh, objects around the eyes and can allow and can facilitate for people to to understand and to see better what a dog is, right? And um, like for example, uh, um, I was talking with my with my nephew the other day, um, just to make a practical example that is coming up now. Uh, and I was reading with him what is written on his book of school book, where uh, still is mentioned. I was really curious I was targeting this type of information I went to the the part that it talks about the uh, expeditions from Europe to the US to, to the Americas actually and uh, and still is mentioned that that was a time of discovery and and so and so forth right and so and I was thinking hey this is still in some books the story that the narrative that uh, are teaching people are teaching to new generations, right? Well, in fact, we know, and that that wasn't a discovery of the Americas. That was the conquering of the Americas. That was the colonization of the America, right? So, and that this, just to make an example of how changing the na changing the narrative it may provide a totally different understanding of a certain historical period or how we how we put ourselves in this world. In the case of dog, that also can useful and actually crucial, essential, because understanding a few aspects of what happened during our parallel evolution, that also may bring some new lenses on, on the eyes of people, and people maybe feel a bit more entitled in perceiving their dogs not as those submissive or needing to respond to some commons, animals, and so and so forth, but as an individual, as a creature that comes with his or her 
heritage, historical, genetic heritage, and that's need, that needs to be valued 100%. Dan, what do you think about that? I'm, I apologize, but I'm having some technical problems with the audio. I'm not sure. Could you repeat the question for me? The question is, how can we build a better relationship with our dogs? What are the aspects that we have to consider to address the relationship that we have in the past and bring it back to now? Okay, thank you. Um, interesting you, you mentioned that because I just took a walk with my dogs and for years I've been in the habit of basically letting them decide where we're going to go. So we have trails on our property <laughs> and they have the freedom to exercise normal dog behavior. If they want to stop and sniff, if they want to keep walking, if they want to go one direction or the other, I just go with them. And I try to give them as much choice as possible in daily life. So they're not being so regimented. And I've noticed they've become more and more relaxed the more I give them options. So I, I try to let them engage in normal dog behaviors, which can be hard to do for some folks if they have a, a pretty strict uh, work schedule and so on, the dogs don't have many opportunities. But I try to make it a, a special effort to empower them to have those kind of choices in their life. I think that's a value point because we come from a perspective <clears throat> that we own dogs, dogs are property. And because we own the dogs, we have demands because there is a belief system. I think it started with a, you know, with a dominance theory and a little bit back into the religion where, you know, there's the authority that owns whatever is below. And so dog owns, a, a, you know, God owns us and the religion owns us and the dog, we own the dog and we own, you know, whoever slaves and all these, all these creatures below us. And it creates a frame idea. And I believe that's a trauma that we have, that we recreate. And we create that trauma towards the dog. I treat you like they treated me. I, I make sure you're not stepping up like I cannot step up. I do these things because to you because I cannot, they don't let me do things on my own. So we, we, we transport that frame and that suffering down the line to the next one and whoever has a tail. So I believe in order to get out of that, we have to admit at some point that we caused the species a trauma and we have to step up for that. I don't expect you to walk around as a person to look, I'm sorry, dog, for what we did to you, but you can be an important aspect of that, recognizing that if you can start treating your dog like a species, like you are, that you make your choices around that, the way you would make choices for your family, you call dogs family, and then all of a sudden they become pets. You said, my dog is my best friend, and then you treat him like an animal. You are friends and cozy and you take that in as a, as a service because the dog does service to you. He protects your family, he's guarding your house. And if he makes one mistake, he's out. There is zero tolerance for your dog growling. There is zero tolerance for the dog stepping up and says, I don't like that. Why are you taking my bone away? Why are you grabbing the sock out of my mouth? Why are you pushing me? Why are you getting me off the couch? I'm in pain. I'm just laying here because I'm suffering from this crappy food I eat. And right now you're just pushing me off the couch. You know what? Bark you. And like you, you raised your voice out up to the shelter. And the shelter is, sorry, we have so many of those guys here. We're going to just kill them and be done with it. Because, you know, bad dogs have to be killed good dogs have to be adopted because good dogs make money, bad dogs don't. So we have to snap out of that frame. And it doesn't matter where you are in Egypt, in Greece, in Italy, in France, in, in US, in Canada, no matter where. We downgrade the dog relationship to that minimum level that we say, are we really worth having a dog at some point? I, I, but I don't want to leave it there and just like how miserable dogs are with humans because they're really not. There's a majority of dogs, to be more precise, 
we kind of guess that we have 1.3 billion dogs on Earth. 800,000, uh, 800 millions are free dogs, do whatever they want. They pee whatever they want, they follow whatever they want. And then the rest of them are in a weird situation. 300 millions are with living in homes. If I, do, do, I, do I say the numbers right? Anybody can make make. I have no up? idea, unfortunately. The last, the la yeah, the last statistic I, uh, I I know is about one one billion. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's a huge number, you know. And, yeah, and, uh, they're just and about they have no percent is anyway ranging. Yeah, right. Because what the study goes through is saying because we cannot count the dogs everywhere, so we say we have a certain percentage of population like 25 dogs per 100 people in certain areas and then we have 25 dogs per uh by thousand people in areas so we cannot really calculate that so we kind of make a snapshot of different cities where we have dog problems yeah and break up the numbers because there, there there are two approaches here the one says the dogs do damage to the human civilizations and this population has to be controlled and they come up with all these ideas of because of rabies because they're dirty blah 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 and then you have the other part that says i cannot live without my dog i have trauma i need my dog i feel alone and want my dog I, I have the right to have a dog. You know, the industry says, well, you need to make money. We need to adopt more dogs out. And and so we see there is a, two polarities here. But my point is, I want to focus on my dog, Dan's dog, Marco's dogs, Amina's dogs, whoever dogs we are in contact with. How can we speak dog and tell them what we want? What, what do you think? Uh, Amina, how how do you speak dog? I think by just to keep trying to learn, like go to experts like you guys and try to learn. Like even though I've had dogs all my life, I feel like only now this year that I started understanding what exactly a dog needs. Like for example, I've been having issues with nutrition. There's nothing about nutrition that we know about for dogs all we know is uh you go to the supermarket and buy this amazing big brand or whatever and you feed the dog and then after a couple of years the dog is sick and people sometimes even get really upset that the dogs is sick and they have to pay so much at the vet and i had this problem with my ducks hunt because she has liver issues so I started reading about it, and then I realized that the dog food. Why I told that I need to. It's like having a human being. I can't just buy like processed food and give my child. I don't want to do that to my dogs either. So I also started getting, and I contacted the nutritionist uh, to move from commercial food back to cooking cooked food at least. But then after I fed cooked food for a couple of weeks, eight weeks it was, I found that the test results were bad again. And then me as a dog parent, I just feel very, very um, responsible for this. I'm, I'm responsible because I believe that when I was cooking meat for her every day and she was eating the meat and veggies, she was going to be healthy. And then I ruined her liver because... I was feeding too much protein. It's just like this to me is so important. And especially in Egypt, we don't know much and we don't have enough experts to speak about uh, no force training or dog behavior. We have zero dog behaviors in Egypt, nothing about nutrition. If you speak to anyone about nutrition, they'll say, ah, oh, you have to get Royal Cannon or Friskies. <laughs> or, like, I don't understand and I believe this is this is the problem and um, to learn how to speak dog is to just sit with the dog and try to see exactly what they want like uh, the dog is barking why is he barking maybe he wants something and I have to help him get this something because he's frustrated because it's important to learn dog behavior and to me it's also very important to always keep in mind that anything the dog is doing that I don't like is because of me. It's not because of the dog, no matter Mark. what. Because he's, he's stuck in, in the house. I can open the door and just leave the house if I don't want to, if I want to. 
he can't he can't because i own the dog and i'm worried about him and so anything that happens inside the house that we don't like it's important for me that people know that it's our fault it's not the dog's fault that he's tearing up your new sofa or he's barking non-stop or he's sick or anything you know Thank you so much. It's important to see that aspect too, because I have a couple of clients in Egypt that I worked with in the past. And the first thing, my first question was, what do you feed? And then they told me what they're feeding. And I was like, and you're worried and you wonder why your dog is reactive when you try to touch him when he's eating. And, and you know, have these prong collars on and already some use shock collars. And I was like, come on, man. And it's so much luck. What were they feeding, Roman? Sorry, what? What were they feeding? What were they I, feeding? I, I, I don't want to. <laughs> no, they're feeding <laughs> whatever they have available on the store, but the uh, store okay, doesn't okay, have okay. a knowledge. Okay. okay, so they buy this yeah. crappy food that's really nothing in there other than garbage and try market it. But it's not, we're not talking about feeding here. However, uh, it's feeding is an important part of the relationship because if I want to speak dog at some point, I need to understand my dog's needs, and. To the question, I, I did a post yesterday and I was um, talking about that, that why do dogs go into a relationship to start with? The first one I think is because they want to learn. And how dogs communicate with each other is because they observe, they learn through observation and they learn through a consistency. And, and I feel the way we think dogs think has nothing to do with a real dog. We think yeah. the dog has has a, has um, in, intellectual thinking. We tell him, "Be a good boy." What What does it mean to a dog? Be a good boy. Obey if me. If if exactly if it doesn't have um, a clear job description, what is a job description? What does a dog expect us to tell him? So when we and I had a conversation back then, and I hope I can bring. My friend, um, he is in Swiss. He, he works with uh, search and rescue dogs. And we had a conversation. Said, How do you train a search and rescue? How do these old monasteries train the Mount, uh, the, um, uh, I miss the name now, um, St. Bernard dogs to rescue people? And it's like, we don't teach them. They learn from the previous group. The puppies follow the big guys and they have two options, either to stay with a person and sandwich them to keep them warm or the dog will come back and help get help. So three dogs go in, one dog returns. The puppy can make a choice which, which job he wants to take and that's the job he will take. And I was like, what? The bark just happened. It, it opened completely my mind. So a dog has his breed traits. And based on those breed traits, he, he will do something that he likes. And because of consequences, something that he tries to do doesn't work, he will try something else that works. And that makes him better than before. So the dogs have such a high capacity on brain to remember yeah. those versions and options and results of their actions. They don't need logic. They don't need to think about things because they can remember. They can remember what you're wearing, what you usually wear, how, how, what time you make your coffee, all these small details. When I ask you, what is your favorite color on your shirt? And I'm like, orange, I think. He knows what color is your favorite color because he knows statistically that you usually wear a red color when you go to work. Therefore, the chances that you go to work after having your coffee, because you grab your keys and because yesterday we were snuggling longer than before yesterday, it's likely that you're gone for more than eight hours. I don't like that. I'm going to scratch your door. I'm going to block you from exiting. I know exactly what's going to happen next. But once the door closes, I don't know where you go. I have no clue. I don't see it. It doesn't exist. So obviously you're gone forever. So from that perspective, if we want to learn to speak dog, we have to learn to listen and remember like a dog. So our conversation with dog is nothing else as remembering and recalling each individual habits and and what they pref and preferences. So the dog will learn from you if you are very clear what you like and what you don't like. 
You don't need to punish for something you don't like, but you can appreciate your dog for something that you like. And your dog is like, oh, I remember that. I can see how good you feel when you do something that you like because I remember it. I remember what food you like because I'm there waiting for that chicken thing. I can smell what you like, you know? And that is a concept that we have to shift what we had before. We stopped remembering and we try to put logic into that. And that what puts the dog down to the zero level because the dog, oh, the dog is not intelligent because it doesn't think like us. We don't understand that we are not intelligent because we don't remember. We don't remember our heritage. We don't remember our our belief systems. We don't remember what happened to us in the past because we choose or it happened to us, we forgot. So in order to remember, and I put the re and member, we have to remember our relationship with dogs. Who am I in relationship to my dog? And why do I have a dog at the first place? Do I remember that I made an a, arrangement with my dog to help me ascend and remember to become who I really can be, my potential? And can I help my dog help me in return to reach that potential that we both arranged upon? And that becomes a sacred relationship as it was in the past. And then as the Balinesian says, I'm not going anywhere to heaven without my dog. That mustn't be heaven that I cannot take my dog with him. I'd rather be here in heaven. Dan, what, what do you I, I like Dan has, a, um, his business is run Happy Buddha, right? That's correct. Yeah, and I was like, I like that. And I'm always suspicious. Like hmm, some people use different terms to kind of camouflage things. And I was like, you know what? I like this guy, who's that? <laughs> who's that? So what is your experience? How do you talk dog? I like to think of the emotional relationship. So I watch my dog's behavior and I watch their body language and I'm looking for signs that they're happy and joyful. So I can encourage them to do the things that they enjoy. And it really is a, a two-way communication. If I can walk into a room and my dog looks at me and his tail wags, I'm getting emotional feedback. They're happy to see me. And if I'm doing a good job as a parent or a steward or a pet owner, whatever terminology you prefer, there's going to be a lot of emotional communication between us, even if no words are said. And that gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction knowing that I'm making their lives as joyful as possible. And a lot of that is simply, as, as already has been stated, just watching and listening and learning from them what their preferences are. And I think they do the same with us too, as, as you said, Roman. Uh, we tell them how we appreciate the things they're doing that, that please us. They have some, some structure in their life. They know what, what kind of behaviors we approve of. And I think they tend to offer that. And I try to do the same in return for them. I, I, so, I so agree with you. We're, oh, who is that? Is it a cat or a dog? No, that's Misa, the dog. Oh, yeah. so cute. Uh, <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, miss I so appreciate you guys. I, I really feel like, you know, if, if we create this momentum, this critical mass of behaviors and scientists to look further of those frames of dominance theory and look into this nonlinear relationship-based theory and and if we come in as as people and says you know i don't want to treat my dog like he's he's a, an item and disposable i want to treat my dog like he will be my my partner at some point and if we create that critical mass we will shift i mean i see how much it shifted in the last 10 years I remember when I started working as a behaviorist and I started talking about spirituality, everybody was like, oh man, he's nuts. <laughs> and I was like, no, I can see it. I can feel it. There must be something behind that. And the people are like, you know what? You're stupid. You know, go back to your old job. And I was like, no, there is something in there. Why I feel something grabs my guts and pulls it out when I see a dog. Why that dog makes me feel this way? 
what is behind that? There's something going on. And so um, I would kind of like to go to, to a happy end of our conversation. And I would like to pull in um, a couple of videos that I'd like you to share. I, I tried to find those. Um, where am I here? Yeah, I want to start with Bali free ranging dogs that uh, my friend Ada, Marco Ada shared. If you, I would like to sh look at it. They're kind of super awesome. Yeah. Cool. Oh, sure. let, let me let me share the audio too. Give me a second. I kind of screwed up here a little bit. Um, let me fix that. Share audio too. Okay, I hope I make it right. Be patient with me. <laughs> yep. No, it's not playing. Too much data. Anyway, I'm gonna share I'm gonna share this link. I can make a description um, of that, a brief description. There are some Bali dogs. Go ahead. Enjoying and playful all around the beach of Bali. And they cope so well with each other with no training ever received. Huh. Free ranging Bali dogs. And Tell me about, um, I don't see if we have everybody there. Amina, tell me a little bit about y your dogs. My, no, she cannot, she's muted. I'm here. Okay. But uh, my dog's living with me? Yeah, or your dogs that you observed um, in, in, in free, free ranging oh, in situations. Funny, the Egyptian dogs, we call them Baladi. Baladi in Egyptian is my country. And um, but the way we use this word in Egypt, sometimes it's to use, it's, it's kind of like something of a lower uh, level. It's like, ew, it's Baladi. But huh. lately, everyone in the animal welfare in Egypt is trying to promote Baladi's and saying that Baladi means my country, it's something we need to be proud of. And I've worked with Baladi, Baladi dogs in uh, Cairo, which are city dogs, and Baladi dogs in Hergada, which are desert dogs. I, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the difference, I think, is that in the desert, they don't have the amount of, um, of uh, threats the city dogs face, like cars, constant human abuse all the time, um, loud noises and like things that really give them a lot of anxiety. But the desert dogs actually are different in a sense that they don't have the same amount of anxiety. They just, not all of them fear humans. Like they learn from each other. Like you said that some of them like humans, we I worked with the Ilguna stars who feed dogs all the time and they do TNR campaigns of castration because of the population. And a lot of the dogs, they know exactly where the food is every time. They know the cars that are driving by. If this is the car of a person who's going to feed them or it's just a stranger car that they're going to be barking at. Uh, the thing about Baladi dogs that most people in Egypt, not most people, all people in Egypt really complain about is their barking. They bark a lot and this is one of the things that makes humans hate the Baladi dogs because of the barking and they're not understanding that the dogs are, first of all, guarding their area. They're always guarding it. Like in Elguna, Elguna is like a small city by the beach and there are different groups of dogs all around and we feed each group every day at certain areas and they don't even let 
strange dogs from outside to enter and they they help with the um, with the overpopulation and they're just very very nice dogs when they are not afraid of the human dealing with them hmm. like and but the city dogs the city dogs have way more anxiety than the desert dogs i believe they 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 see a lot like the 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 kind of abuse in Egypt that is targeted on Baladi is is constant. It's every single day constant abuse of shooing, throwing rocks at them. Uh, uh, just like some people just torture them. They bring them to torture them. So. A lot of them just create this anxiety that helps them survive the streets in Egypt. Like if if the dog in in the city is not afraid of humans, he's going to be abused. He's going to be hit by a car. But if he has this anxiety and fear, he's going to survive the streets. So I believe that the Baladi dogs in Egypt manifested this fear to survive. And a lot of the people who are adopting Baladi dogs now, a lot of them um, they they try to work with this anxiety and fear and they don't understand it. They don't understand that it's in the breed. It became in the breed that they will have this anxiety of fear. They will all the time, you know. It's, it's interesting also to see the difference between the beach dogs and the city dogs. Beach dogs are, I think, are much chill. You find them just sitting there, walking around, uh, sometimes going into residential areas to swim in the pools or hang out by the beach and look for food. And But the city dogs are always afraid. Hmm. That's about the Baladi dogs. Interesting, interesting. Is it like and in Bali? Well, um, well, I can I can draw a, a, a connecting line. I mean, between some urban areas where dogs are a bit more stressed, so to speak, yeah. because uh, because there is a, a a lot more going on, uh, a lot more cars, a lot more uh things happening you know a lot more uh people around you know and so they they may live a lifestyle that is a bit more alert based on alert and yeah. survival mode than those living in some uh beach areas where there is a different demographic first of all so uh, not necessarily less going on. Maybe it's a very crowded area, but there is a different demographic and there is a, a population that is more likely a merge of local community and international community, yeah. which means that there are uh, more uh, variability of people, a different approach. There may be some international people that approach dogs on fur ranging dogs with more interest and sociability than the locals in some areas, right? Yeah. So it may be totally the other way around. There may be also some, actually, the local community in Bali take really, at least in some places in and in, in, in some families, better to say, uh take really good care of arranging dogs right for the reason we were mentioning before those dogs they do not necessarily feel that they own that dog that they own own the dogs <laughs> those dogs but those dogs are part of the village are part of the community so basically they go they associate they affiliate they associate with a certain area with a certain house with a certain household right and those people uh, feed them, throw them at, at them sometimes some leftover or just feed them. And so dogs gain their their daily meal by guarding also, for example, that area, right? So those are typical dynamics that we can observe in uh, in the village context, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, there are some traits that may be similar in different areas. Uh, not sure if... Uh, um our friend wants to add something 
Dan. Dan. Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't so have any experience with, with free-ranging dogs, and I don't see them. I live out in the countryside, away yeah. from the city, but I do see coyote, and I've Love always welcomed them. We've had, we've had coyote dens on our property, and even if I was riding my horse and I'd encounter a coyote, they weren't ever threatening. They'd stop, yeah. and they'd observe, and they'd just go away. But I, I'm surrounded by farmers who yeah. shoot the coyotes. Yeah. And I've I've seen them just attacking coyotes because they they appear in the environment. And it's really disturbing to me. Yeah. Uh, I respect all animals, and I I take great joy in just being part of the environment. I don't I don't think of myself as an owner of this property. I'm just here temporarily. Right. But but the universe is all around us and, and all these creatures that live among us. And it, it's been interesting when I've been walking my dogs and we encounter a coyote, the communication that goes on between them is, is really fascinating. There's never been any sign of tension or a uh, threat. Wow. So they'll, they'll make eye contact. They both look, um, interested in the other and then they just part company and i've seen that with the uh, foxes we used to have foxes on our property too but occasionally i'd, I'd find one with a gunshot um, dead on our property so our neighbors don't seem to like other animals very much um, yeah in in egypt the government and the Association of Veterinary Medicine are the ones who go down and poison street dogs. They wow. sometimes they put nails in the food, like they go and give them food, and the dogs are so happy to eat the food that it kills them, you know. And uh, there's there's been a lot of fights on TV from animal welfare activists and rescue uh, and rescuers about this, and it's the Ministry of um, agriculture that teams up with the veterinary medicine association to kill the dogs because they and their their excuse is always like because of the lack of education that a barking dog to them means a rabid dog and they're afraid huh. they, they, like they don't even know what the symptoms of rabies is you know like they just think any barking dog mm -hmm. is rabid which is crazy and there's been Actually, in Egypt, the past three years, there's been a lot of awareness because of social media, especially Facebook, all the sharing of, uh, of, of the killings and people like, oh, my God, I just found this dead dog. He's poisoned and all, the gru all his group is poisoned. There's one still alive. What can we do? And it's, it's becoming more and more. And even just the other day, there was this um, uh, official decision to kill all the dogs in her gada and people were were like kind of protesting against this people who have been doing uh tnr campaigns for 16 years in her gada are protesting this and it's just so deep in the mentality that they don't even want to understand that killing them is not going to eliminate them it's never going to stop dogs from breeding and producing more dogs you know you're just and sometimes they even kill dogs who are castrated and vaccinated and it's i don't know what it is with humans especially with dogs like i don't want to say i understand the killing of other animals because i don't understand the killing of anything but but like why the dogs have been living in egypt and we have this egyptian god called anubis who has the head of a of a of a dog some people say it's a coyote a jackal or a dog but it's so ingrained in our culture as egyptians that dogs uh, cats cows uh, and a lot of other animals have been um, sacred in egypt but now when you go to egypt all you'll see with and even I have one of the Baladi dogs, people in the street when I'm walking him, they look at him and they're like, wow, what's this breed? And I'm like, it's a Baladi. What? 
it's a baladi no way this is this is a mix of baladi and husky i'm sure i'm like no it's a baladi why why do we have to like put baladis next to a german shepherd like a lot of people like they have a lot of the same colors and markings of a lot of other breeds they just decide um one second my dog is eating the cat food <laughs> <Go> <laughs> Uh, uh, taking advantage of you being distracted yeah. and so passionate about your tellings. Yeah. So anyway, uh, guys, um, Roman just wrote me, I'm not sure if everybody can listen. Uh, yep. Uh, Roman just wrote me in, in a chat and um, mentioning that he's experiencing some uh, technical issues. So he's not going to be able to to probably to connect again but so it asks us to 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 conclude and it leaves us with the last questions it gives an a gives us a last question that is what is the takeaway of this sharing i let it to you guys girls and guys then maybe i also say something and then we say goodbye <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Dan? Well, I think the takeaway message for the, the average pet owner is to try to have the best relationship you can have with your dog and not try to have the most obedient dog. My dogs are well-mannered, but I don't want uh, obedient robots. I want yes. living creatures that I can enjoy and I want them to feel that they're safe around me and that they have a good life. And I think if we can do that as pet owners, that's the best gift that we can give them. And we receive a lot in return. So I think it's, it's reciprocal. Yeah, I think so too. Like I think uh, to, to respect our dogs and, and just, take them out of the square that they need to be something we want them to be. We want them to be who they are, like whatever this is, whatever they want to do, they should do by teaching them and by showing them, like you said before, that not punish for bad behavior, but praise good behavior, what we call good or bad behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, complementarily, I can add that, yes, uh, what is core in our relationship with our dog is to have this strong bond, which doesn't mean screaming on the dog or the dog responding to, to our commands or indication, even the most basic like sit and stay, something like that. That that doesn't necessarily mean to have a good bond with the dogs, right? Exactly. It's more to cultivate together a calming energy and being part of a group because uh, um, mentioning again what we have been discussing previously, you know, is uh, and also Dan has been mentioning about emotions and you also have been mentioning about other aspects and so Roman, right? right? So we are part of a family, part of a group with our dogs. And so we need to understand that dogs reason that way or feel that way. They connect with our way of being, not with our way of thinking or commanding and so on, right? right? We need to be and we need to be calm because when we are calm and we are reliable, they feel confident enough, safe enough, and entitled also to fully express themselves, right? So this is something that for every dog owner, dog caretaker, dog parent, wanted to call it dog owner, that's okay, just to make the bridge for those that do not do not make yet that distinction between oh, yeah, what's yeah, dog yeah. parent. I've been asking, I've been asked that uh -huh. from a client. I, I'm not a dog parent. What What do you mean? Not quite sure. But yeah, you have a dog in your family. Yeah, but I own. Yeah. So this is we need to clarify also that and not taking for granted that it also people understand what's a dog parent, right? Yeah. So but, uh, uh -huh. yes, long story short, yeah, we need to cultivate that good, calm energy which opens paves the paves the way 
to a strong and reliable bond. That's core, right? Which um, is what we mm -hmm. need to all work towards to improve the life of dogs and people out there. So um, uh, if you have anything else to say, that's the moment. Otherwise, I guess we can say goodbye. And uh, yeah. so Roman is waiting for us to close. Yeah. <laughs> So nice it's been great you talking with you. Great talking to you. Very happy. And I hope we can uh, to talk and share more soon. Yeah. yeah. And thank you, Roman, also to set up this, this sharing. Thank you, Roman. <laughs> OK. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay guys sorry for that finally i made it <clears throat> so i had to reboot my system and i so appreciate you guys everyone for joining us today in our um, very interesting um show with um daniel and with with um let me plug that correctly in here so we can be better with marco ada and um amina and thank you so much for being part of that today because i think it's very important to make that shift and help to get dogs back to be dogs again so thank you so much again for joining us today. This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend.